I hope you've had a lovely, lovely week. The weather has been wonderful, and uh, the sun has been shining. I managed to get myself burnt to a crisp. Uh, on fr- no- none of, nothing about that should be surprising to me. So, I mean, I'm 36 years old, for crying out loud. I think I've been burnt every year of my life in May <laughs> at this time. You think, I probably, I could probably not bother with the cream today. And then you come home. I mean, anybody with fair skin will, will sympathize with this feeling when you come home and you, you look in the mirror and you think, you catch sight of yourself on the way past and you think, oh dear, <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in trouble. I'm tr- I mean, it's only five o'clock and I'm already a nice salmon pink. <laughs> and of course, as the, as the evening goes on, you know, the lights, the lights go down and somehow a glow remains. Uh, but it's just, it's just calming down. It's not the worst I've had, fortunately. But, uh, but yeah, some, th- some people never learn and I'm one of them. Uh, but I'm going to be doing the teaching today, so there's an irony there. Um, there's an irony there somewhere. Let's not explore that too much. Okay, so the title for today is Freedom, Love, and A Tale of Two Gardens. Uh, we talk a lot uh, in our community about freedom, uh, and, and so we should, because the Bible talks a lot about um, freedom. Uh, but actually, the the world, the Western world, talks a lot about freedom too. It talks a lot about freedom. Um, and, and actually, um, the thing is that, that we are always being shaped uh, by the, the, the cultural forces around us. And, and, if, and if we don't, um, if we aren't clear on, on what we mean by a word like freedom, then it would be possible to assume that, that we mean the same when we talk about freedom that anybody means in our culture. And, and in fact, we mean something radically different. The Bible, I'm convinced, means something radically different when it talks about freedom than, than the world conventionally um, thinks when they talk about freedom. And, and the reason that this is important, I mean, if you're only wanting to, tr- to walk a mile, um, then if your compass is one degree off, it doesn't really matter. Because you'll only be out, out a little bit from where you wanted to be by the end of it. But if you are wanting to walk 50 miles, or 100 miles, or 200 miles, then you better be sure before you start that your compass is true north. Because the longer you want to walk, the more uh, errors or, or just things that are slightly off where they should be will show, will show up. And, and the reason I'm saying that is because we are in this for the long haul. We're in this for the long haul. I was in a, a very old church building recently, and I was thinking about the fact that the people who, chatting to somebody about it, um, about the fact that um, the people who, who built this church and gave, gave um, to build this church building, they were doing something because they had in their head a concept that stretched beyond their own lives. That they wanted to leave something for the future generations. Where in the world do we get this idea in our culture that we can, that we can just sell these buildings for for flats. I mean, these buildings don't belong to us. We belong to the building. We belong to this vision, this, this thing that's been rolled out uh, down the centuries, God's people handing on a legacy from one generation to the other. And if we're going to do that, it won't be just in, in the buildings that we leave, but it will be in the values that we leave too. So we We've got to make sure that we thread these things properly, or at least as well as we are able. Not to say that actually, you know, you get the final word on anything. Anyway, you know, God is always revealing himself in new ways. We're always learning more and more about what, uh, what he means uh, and what the Bible means. But, but nevertheless, um, we want to be as, as well as we are able clear 
on what we mean by things like this and things like freedom. So I'm going to read, I said it's a tale of two gardens. And the, the first is the Garden of Eden, uh, and the second we'll get to later. I'm just going to leave that as a wee cliffhanger. So, um, yeah, I know. Some of you are so excited. Um, okay, Genesis chapter 2 then. And I'm going to read um, uh, 7 to 9, 15 to 8, and 23 to 25. Um, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's all I can say. Uh, <laughs> I, I probably should have read the whole chunk, but I thought for time I'd just chop it up. So we're going to start at verse, verse 7. Uh, the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east. And there he put the man who he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but... Of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And then the Lord said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make for him a helper. Sorry, I will make make him a helper fit for him. And then if we skip to 23, this happens, and Adam bursts into song. Then the man said, this is at last bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and they were not ashamed. Why don't we just pray for a second? Lord Jesus, we thank you for your presence with us. Lord, we thank you that you, um, you are a great teacher, Holy Spirit. Lord, that Jesus, you said that you would not leave us as orphans, but that you would come to us and that your spirit would lead us into all truth. And so we invite you again this morning. Lord, I invite you into my heart again this morning, Lord, to teach to teach me and to help us to learn as best we are able, Lord, what your word is saying to us, Lord, that we might leave the best possible legacy and we might walk as, as far as we can in you. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Okay, so what on earth do these verses have to do with a concept of? of freedom. Well, the first thing that they say to me um, is that human beings were created to live in freedom. That is the original state and the original intention for God. It is, it's in a way, when you think about it, it's unthinkable that a creator God would want his creation to do anything other than what he made them to do. Yeah. It's, it's, it's the kind of, it's the heart of, of, of every parent, actually, that their kids grow up to, to kind of discover themselves, who they are, and, 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 to, and to follow um, that, that sense of who they are so that they can, they can live out who they were intended to be. It's, 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 a kind of, it's just a desire deep within parents that this would be the case. And it's no different from God. God wants, uh, God created us for freedom and his intention is that we would, that we, intention was that we remained in that state. And freedom, freedom in the Garden of Eden looks like Something. It looks like being naked, being vulnerable, 
and intimate without fear or without shame. Um, in our culture, we still use uh, freedom in this way. Um, I don't know if you've ever been to a wedding, when, uh, gentlemen, when you've worn a kilt. Um, at some point, what often happens at the start of the day is somebody will kind of sidle up beside you and another gentleman wearing a kilt uh, on the way into the, to the service and he'll just give you a wee nod and say, are you going free? <laughs> You'll know what he means. Are you going free? Indeed. Um, this, <laughs> this sense of freedom is preserved in our culture in this one moment. <laughs> it's just something that gentlemen do. Scottish gentlemen, anyway, at that particular moment, I found it's, it's, it's a common occurrence. Women have absolutely no idea what I'm talking about, but men, you will understand this. Um, and really what it speaks of, what the, what the kind of the nakedness of, of Adam and Eve speak of is that they are living without masks, without costumes, without pretense. They are free. They are free. And actually, so many of us in life uh, and so much of the world is living behind a mask, living under a costume, pretending to be something that they're not in order that they might be accepted or acceptable. And, and that is not freedom. And this story tells us that that is not the original intention for humanity. But this is not the same as our culture's mantra for to be yourself. I once, uh, somebody once sent me a, a birthday card, and on the front it said in big letters, be yourself. And then underneath in very small letters it said, is the worst advice you can give some people. <laughs> And it was my brother, so it's okay. Uh, but, but commonly in our culture, when people say, you know, you've just got to be yourself, what they mean is a kind of individualistic, self-centered being of yourself. Without reference to those around you, actually the more true you can be to yourself is really the kind of more disconnected you can be, the more uninfluenceable you are from those around you. This, in our culture, is often what is meant by this concept of being, just be yourself. Just trust yourself. But that is, that is not what Adam and Eve were like, because you see their nakedness, their ability to be themselves freely was entirely dependent upon being in the presence of God. Their connection to God was the thing that allowed them to be themselves. And, and this needs to be continually affirmed. It was like freedom in this sense is almost a kind of self-forgetting. That you are in the presence of someone who is so loving and so affirming and provides for you in such a real way that you almost forget about yourself. A Think about that. A relationship of love that is so consuming and so overwhelming that you almost forget. That you, in fact, you do forget about you. Now, I don't know about you, but I never forget when I'm naked. Never. I mean, you have occasional dreams where you arrive at work. Ah! I, you know, I go to my work. Sometimes I forget my phone. Sometimes I forget my wallet when I'm at the shops. But I never get to the shops and think, good grief, it's happened again. <laughs> Guy in a kilt walks past, you think, mate, I'm going free. <laughs> you don't know the half of it. Never happens. It never happens. But something about Adam and Eve being in the presence of God. Imagine that. Imagine a relationship. You know, and we get a, we get a glimpse of this sometimes in our loving relationships on earth, where 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 we are we're, we're so 
you know, we, we, we kind of feel our, our imperfections, our, our insecurities kind of slide away in the presence of somebody who just loves us and accepts us and will just always be there for us. And I think that, that, that there's Adam and Eve, because they were in the presence of this perfect love, it was a kind of self-forgetting. You see a glimpse of this, I think, when David dances in his pants. You know, it's something, it's always to do with nakedness, isn't it? Something, it, it what? Then he is, it, you know, the ark, the presence of the Lord is brought back into Jerusalem. And David strips down to his pants and dances a jig down the street. And, uh, you know, we, we have this phrase in our culture, don't we, that, you know, we should dance as if no one is watching. It's really interesting the way that's put, dance as if no one is watching. In fact, really what the Bible is saying is that we should dance as though we're being watched by just one. Just one who loves us so completely that in his presence, all our imperfections and insecurities suddenly drift away and we feel free. This is not just, just be, just be yourself, get out there on your own, make your own mind up about what you think. This is, this is being yourself, but being deeply, deeply connected. And it is a, it is, it is a freedom in, in these moments that becomes deeply connected to a concept of purpose. Um, Eric Liddell um, who is a great hero um, uh, of the faith, and particularly in, in Scotland. Um, and if you've seen Chariots of Fire, then, I mean, just go and watch that film again. I watched a clip of it recently on, on, uh, on Facebook. Sorry, not on Facebook, on YouTube. And uh, I just found myself weeping. I mean, it was like a two-minute clip. And, and, and just, just because... Here is a man who, or he has this line, he says, um, I believe that God made me for a purpose. And he says, for China, for going overseas on, uh, on mission to China, which indeed he did. He says this, but he also made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To give it up would be to hold him in contempt. It's not just for fun. To win is to honor him. To win is to honor him. This is a man who felt a freedom. A freedom to pursue all that God had put in him. And this concept of freedom is closely connected to this idea of purpose. This is, it's, it's that sense that we are doing the thing that we were created to do. That is freedom. And because of that, freedom is manifestly not the absence of work. And actually, in our culture, you know, what we... You often hear this, you know, I mean, I'm tied to the job, but at some point I'm going to retire, and then I'll be free. Do you know what I mean? Then I'll, you know, it's, this, it's kind of playing into this idea that, um, that a kind of rootless, um, purposeless existence where we just get to kind of fulfill our every whim and do what we want, this is freedom. And and everything else is kind of a kind of of slavery. And yet for Lidl to to end up winning the medals that he did, he needed to train hard, a lot. He needed to, in in a way, put himself through a degree of suffering, physical suffering. He had to go through the frustration of of, of not improving and then, and the pain, the physical pain. 
but it was freeing because it, because it was connected to his purpose. Because, it was, because every day when he went to train, it was taking him closer to the reason why he was born. And that is the thing that makes you feel free. That is the thing that makes you feel alive. And we know this is, to be, we know this is true. We, we do not allow, we do not say to people who have never played the guitar before on a Sunday, just, just stand up there. Just take that wee guitar and you, you just give it a wee strum. Go on, lad. Give it a wee strum. Just see what comes out. Just go free. You know, you don't get told on your first day of piano lessons. You, you just jump up in that stool and just bash these keys. Just see what happens. You don't, what you get told is this is middle C. This is, this, is, this is how a piano works. And you engage in a process of learning, a discipline of learning. And, but when you see a jazz pianist in full flight, wow, does he not look free. He looks free. But it is a freedom that has come through a process of discipline. That, that's, 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 and that's, that's what we think. That's what we think for, for our kids. Don't we? You know, you, somebody told me a great um, analogy for this once. Said, if, you, if you have a life a, or, or, or a boat in, in the ocean and it has no sides to it, there's no sides to it. What, will, what happens in that situation is that everybody stands as close to the middle as possible, as far away from the edges as possible, because they are terrified that they'll be swept into the sea, okay? But if you take that same boat and you put a barrier around the edge, then guess what? People have the freedom to walk right to the edge Maybe even to lean over. There'll be one cheeky monkey who'll drag his hand in the water. Why? Because the boundary, the restriction in a sense, is the very thing that creates a space for freedom. This is not commonly understood in our culture. You know, it's, Jesus did say, you know, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Absolutely. And work when it become, becomes destructive, when it fails to honor how we were made and who made us. That's definitely true. But the modern Western dream of retired idleness is not freedom. And nor will it provide us with the fulfillment that we seek. Freedom looks like the presence, indeed. And again, this is countercultural, but freedom looks like the presence of restricting commitments that honors how we are made. The tree that God put in the garden is classically in our culture seen as a symbol of lack of freedom. You know, and, and actually, faith in general is seen that way, I would say, in our culture. But actually, the tree is a symbol of the choice that Adam and Eve make, at least in chapter 2, to be in a loving relationship with God. This is how it works. If you put a fish in the ocean, it will look beautiful and majestic, and it will twist and turn and duck and dive through the ocean like a silver arrow. It will be beautiful. But let's say that fish one day swims into a bay and looks up through the water and sees a dog running along the shoreline, tongue hanging out, tail wagging. And he looks at that dog and he says, gosh, 
I wish I was like that dog. That dog just looks so free. Look at him. He's taking a leak against that rock. He's so free. If you were to take that fish out of the ocean and put him on that rock, he would flop around like he didn't have a clue what he was doing. And if you were to leave him there long enough, eventually he would die. Why? Because the fish was made for the ocean. And the dog was made for the land. Freedom is not the absence of restrictions. It is the presence of the liberating restrictions. The thing that, things that honor how we were made. And who made us? And when we are in these appropriate restrictions, we find a sense of freedom that we will not find anywhere else. And what then is the liberating restriction for a human being? Well, it can be nothing other than a relationship of love, both with your fellow creations and with your creator. So we see that freedom, you see, the the tree in the garden, the tree in the garden represented Adam and Eve's, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, is is the thing that represents their freedom. Because if God made them without a negative choice, you see, free, freedom is dependent upon your choice. You know, that, that is what freedom is. You know, sometimes I like to trick my kids, you know, and, and make it seem like I'm giving them a choice. You know, you can, have, you can have your dinner using this spoon, or you can have your dinner using this spoon. It feels like it's a choice, but really, I'm just getting them to eat their dinner. And one day they're going to figure that out, and we're going to have a problem. But... <laughs> I'm going to need a new strategy. But the point is this. The point is this, that sometimes we, we, we feel that, that unless there is, is, is true choice, there is, unless there is true freedom, then there's actually no capacity for love. Robots can never love you. Okay, some of you guys playing Xbox all day, you need to understand this. Your Xbox will never love you. <laughs> Computers, they can't, robots cannot love us because they, can't, they are not free to choose. Choice is what creates the conditions of love. So freedom, we learn from these, this, these early chapters of the Bible, is the only atmosphere in which love can grow. And it is in that that its value really lies. Soil is not the primary thing in your garden, is it? Nobody comes around to your garden in July and says, wow, that is amazing soil. (laughs) You You don't go to the Chelsea Garden Show or whatever it's called and, you know, just see row after row of just beds of soil. You know, no award is given in gardening competitions for the best soil. The soil isn't the point. The things that grow in the soil are the point. And anybody who does, I mean, maybe somebody here who's like bang into gardening and they're like, may I talk about soil all the time. Please don't be offended. I would hazard this though. You're only interested in soil to the extent that you can grow things in it. The point is what grows in the soil. Freedom is important. It's it's crucial. It's crucial in fact. But it is only important to the extent that it allows love to grow. Love is the main thing.
Freedom, therefore, is, is almost a neutral thing, in fact. It's neither positive nor negative. It's just because, you know, freedom allows people to make some extremely bad choices. You know, do some really damaging things. And sure enough, a chapter later, Adam and Eve proved that point spectacularly well by making a disastrous choice. And we do that all the time as well. I do that all the time. What's interesting is the fact that even though our culture says that freedom is to be found in breaking covenant, in being independent, in being yourself, we discover in this passage that what God is saying is that breaking covenant is a path to loneliness and shame and isolation and finally a prison. It is a prison of a different sort. And we need to understand this because this is not what your culture is telling you every minute of every day. It's saying something completely different. So, that is the first garden. And that is what we learn about freedom through that that garden experience. But it's interesting that just as Adam and Eve failed in the garden of Eden, there was another man. There was another man. And there was another garden. And that man was Jesus, and that garden was Gethsemane. So why don't you turn, if you can, to, uh, let's read it from, let's read it from Luke, Luke 22, and verse 39. So what, we learned a lot about freedom through the Garden of Eden, and one of the main things we learned was that freedom really is important because what it creates are the conditions for love. And in Gethsemane, we are going to discover what love is really all about. Verse 39, and he came out and went, as was his custom, this is Jesus, to the Mount of Olives, and the disciples followed him. And when he came to the place, he said to them, pray that you may not enter into temptation. And he withdrew from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And there appeared more earnestly, sorry, uh, sorry, and there appeared to him an angel from heaven, strengthening him. And being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat became like great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose from prayer, he came to the disciples and found them sleeping, and he said to them, why are you sleeping? Rise and pray that you might not enter into temptation. One of the important things to to remember almost as we come to this amazing portion of the story and life of Jesus is that G- the scripture makes it clear that Jesus was the freest man who ever walked the face of the earth. We read in, in, in Matthew 26, uh, in the Matthew account of Ge- the Garden of Gethsemane, just, um, just after this Um, There's this great moment where Peter, lovely bloke, but my goodness, uh, he didn't have a clue what was going on most of the time. Um, As to be honest, we all all feel like that most of the time. Um, He, um, you know, the the, the Romans turn up to arrest Jesus. Peter thinks, "What what will be helpful in this moment? Somehow, in this moment, Peter thinks drawing a sword and cutting off someone's ear would be helpful. It's hard to imagine how that made sense in his head, but it did. Um, and, and, and Jesus says, says to Peter, put your sword back in its place. For who, all who take uh, the sword will perish by the sword. Um, do you think, 
And this is crucial. Do you think that I cannot appeal to my Father and He will at once send me more than 12 legions of angels? But how then should the Scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? What he's saying is, I don't have to do this. I don't have, I am one prayer away from getting out of here. You know, I am Jesus, get me out of here. That's all he'd have to say. Okay. He is one prayer away. And this is, the, this is a, it's really important that you understand this. As you, as you read through the passion narratives at the end of the Gospels, that it's, really, it's really important that you understand that at every stage in the process, up until the very moment of his death, Jesus is one prayer away from getting out of it. He is entirely free. He even says it. He says, no one takes my life from me. No one. You know, he was, he was talking to an oppressed people group. Their whole lives were controlled by the greatest army the world had ever seen. They were in total subjection. And here comes Jesus saying, no one takes my life from me. But I lay it down of my own accord. I have the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. And interestingly, he says, this charge I have received from my Father. Even that bold assertion of freedom is not independent of a relationship with the Father. So, if he was the freest man, why then Gethsemane? Why then the cross? There's only one answer to that question. Jesus was not Jesus was held on the cross by one thing and one thing alone, and that was love. Love was the constraining force on the cross. Because you see, love is making a free choice, it has to be free, to lay down your freedoms so that another person can be free. Greater love, Jesus says, hath no man than this, than that he lay down his life for his friends. And we all know this. We know that this is true of our relationships with our, you know, if, we, if, we've got, if you've got kids, or if you're married, or, or just with your friends, that you, that you would, that is what love is. If that, I mean... It doesn't, love doesn't mean anything else. It doesn't mean anything if it's not expressed in sacrificial actions. The other thing that this, this garden experience tells us about love is that this choice to lay down your life is a commitment and not a feeling. It is a commitment fundamentally and not a feeling. Passion is not the same as excitement. Passion fixes itself upon a target and makes commitments knowing that there will be days when you don't feel like it. Okay, which is why I have never sustained any significant periods of physical exercise <laughs> in my life. I'm just not passionate about it. 
I mean, I'm, I'm very occasionally excited. <laughs> very occasionally excited about it. But I'm never passionate about it. Because I never make a plan for the moment when I'm not excited. You see, there's this amazing writer um, called... Uh, David Brooks, he's a secular Jew who writes for the New York Times and he lectures at Yale University in philosophy. And he set out um, on a quest a few years ago to discover what makes people great. And so he, he researched um, all kinds of, of, of people who had been great throughout, uh, throughout time and over history and he looked at them. And he, and he wrote an amazing book called The Road to Character. And uh, which is really interesting and has lots of resonance, I think, uh, with, with a kind of biblical worldview. But I, I watched him once give a, a commencement address, so a kind of a graduation in America. And he was speaking, uh, I think it was Harvard. And he said this, he said, I am speaking to some of the most free people that have ever walked the face of the earth. You are... You are incredibly highly educated. You have gone to one of the best universities on the, that has have ever existed, not just on the planet now, but has ever existed. And, and, and many of you, if you're not wealthy now, you're about to take on jobs that will make you wealthy. You have money, you have status, you have education. You are freer than almost any group of people that has ever existed on the face of the earth. And then he said this, but I tell you, your life will not be defined by the manner in which you explore your freedoms, but by the places where you choose to end them. What makes a life is our commitments. What makes our lives is the things that we hold to and will not let go of, come what may. And there is, strangely, a freedom that comes to us in that moment of consecration. It's this freedom that we love in our action heroes like Braveheart, you know, or Gladiator. I mean, that's really aging me, aren't they? There's two 90s action movies right there. <clears throat> but the thing about these characters is that these are men who at the beginning, in the first act of the film, everything that they really, that they really lo- longed for in life is taken from them. They're kind of stripped bare, in a way, of all their entanglements until they're living for just one thing. So, at the start of, of, of Braveheart, um, William Wallace, in a flagrant denial of the actual historical picture, has his whole family taken from him by the oppressing army. And suddenly he's not living for lots of things, he's living for one thing. And in a sense, what, what his enemies discover is that you can't kill a man like that because he's dead already. You can't kill a man like that because he's dead already. And that reminds me of something that Paul said to the church in Galatia. He said, Far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Love is submitting yourself finally to the world of God. Not my will, but your will be done. This is totally alien in our culture. 
Freedom is about choice, it's about options, it's about keeping your options open. Jesus, the freest man who ever existed, gave himself no options. It was a day that he had planned for. He knew, he knew, I will not emotionally want this. But he has settled in his heart, not my will, but your will. Love is horrendously hard, but it always leads to fulfilling purpose. And in this, it always leads to joy. In John 12, Jesus says, Now my soul is troubled. What then shall I say? What options have I got? You know? You are going through a hard thing in life where you just think, yeah, well, this is hard, but you know, what can I do? You know, I mean, I, would, I wouldn't choose to be here. But what, what, what other, I don't have another option. Love. I'm a prisoner of love in this moment. But what can I, what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. Shall I say, you know, get me out of here? But, Jesus said it was for this purpose. It was for this purpose that I have come. Love is sometimes horrendously hard, but it always leads to fulfilling our purpose. And in this way, it always leads to joy. When we are free, we can love. And when we are love, when we love, we are led to sacrifice. And in sacrificial love, we discover our purpose for our lives. And in discovering our purpose, we find joy and freedom. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that you have set us free and we are free indeed. Jesus, I thank you that you broke the curse of sin on the cross. Lord, that you broke the power of sin and death in our lives on the cross. Lord, that we are no longer subject or slaves to these forces in our lives. You have set, the Son has set us free and we are free indeed. But Lord, you also said that the world would know us by our love. So I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us to find our commitments and in that find our purpose and in that find our joy. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.